what is the most representative question style and resource that will represent the question style of step one? And that is, drum roll please. Send this video to all of your second year friends, even your first year friends, or anyone who just got into medical school so they can kind of get this tea really early because this tea is like piping hot, honey. I'm telling you, this is, this is tea. This is tea, honey. I'm being extra, but honestly, like if someone would have told me this last year around this time, whew, I would have been on fire. I'm so glad I was able to record this video, get this out to you. Number one, not everyone is going to score a 250 or above. I know on YouTube there's so many videos with people saying how they got a 250, how they got a 260, how they got a 270, and it makes students believe that that is the only score that will allow you to match or you know allow you to uh, work in the specialty that you want to do or get interviews or whatever it is and that's really not the case. A uh, 250 or higher is an amazing score that's very impressive and all the students that get those scores, uh, kudos to you, congratulations, that's great. But the truth is when you look at the bar graph of all of the national scores and all of the of all the students that have taken step one, most of the scores are clustered around the average which is 230. So within a little bit above 230 and a little bit below 230, that's where most students will score for step one. And by just having these like precedents of like 250, 260, it kind of makes you feel that, you know, if you're below that, then you're less smarter than the next person. And that's not the case. So a lot of those students that scored a 250, 260, or 270, when they took their first MBME practice test, they were probably already uh, scoring 240s and then you all you also have to think about some some students who have three months or more to study for these exams that there's a lot of factors that play into that and I'm not taking that I'm not taking anything away from them but you also have to realize where you're starting off from there's some people who make tremendous leaps who you know can increase their score by 70 points you know if they start off with a lower MBME and can get a 250 which is amazing but I would just generally say, you know, aim high. It's not the end of the world if you do not get a 250, 260, or 270. You can still match. You will still become a doctor. You will go into the special specialty of your choice. Just do your best to not let imposter syndrome take over you and consume you during dedicated study period. And you will be a-okay. My second point is that UWorld is a textbook. UWorld is a question bank that is the best resource for step one. UWorld has the best explanations ever, and it's really, really all you really need for step one. Yes, you need first aid, pathoma, and the rest of them, but UWorld has all the information that you could really ever need. They have so much uh, thorough information, and their explanations for each question is just, honestly, it's like unmatched, I would say, for step one. And a lot of people don't realize that UWorld, though it is a question bank, UWorld is more of like a textbook if you read it as such. So that means that going through UWorld, you want to read your explanations thoroughly, inside and out. If you got a question right, you still need to read every single answer choice to see why it was right or right why it was wrong. So that means reading A through E or whatever it is, reading the little summary at the bottom and making sure that you fully understand that question. So what I learned was that Doing UWorld is about quality over quantity. And a lot of people would say, you know, you should finish 80 to 90% of UWorld before you take your test. And that's the mistake that I made. I was doing my best to just like finish these questions, but I wasn't thoroughly reviewing every uh, question that I got. And in the end, looking back, I feel like if I definitely would have just spent more time reviewing questions and maybe finishing even like 60% of UWorld on my second run, I would have done much better because I would have had a fuller understanding of some of these concepts that I was struggling with, but I was just spending so much time just getting through questions. And yeah, you may get through questions, but when certain high yield questions are on your exam, if you didn't know the answer inside and out, you will not be able to 
answer some of those like tricky questions when you're torn between two different uh, really good answers. Third is MBMEs. I feel like I took way too many MBMEs. I think I took seven or eight MBMEs because at the time they still had some of the old ones. So I bought the old ones and then I bought all the new ones. I did all of the new ones. And the problem with the MBMEs is that buying too many or just doing too many for me was really bad for my mental health. There's some people who say that MBMEs are very predictive of their step score, and then some say that they weren't. In my case, MBMEs were not very predictive of my step score, and I took the new MBMEs. I also felt like the MBMEs are really good for getting a baseline and then, you know, just seeing your progress. But also for me, while I was taking it every week, the MBMEs are actually a source of anxiety for me. So as my score increased one week and the next week it went down, I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? But when I looked back, I realized that from all of the MBMEs, most of the topics that I didn't do so well on, like my weak points, they pretty much stayed the same. So if I would have just looked at the MBME more as a gauge for my strong and weak areas, that would have been more effective than just continually taking MBMEs and making myself feel inadequate week after week after week. For sure, my anxiety definitely played a large part in my overall performance on the step. Taking way too many MBMEs definitely played a major role in that. In my opinion, MBMEs are very helpful to see overall concepts, what will be tested, but the question style of MBMEs is not similar to the questions on step one. MBMEs to me can be a little vague and you kind of don't really know what they're asking sometimes and so you kind of need to infer and you're kind of just like, okay, maybe this is what they're saying and you pick an answer. That's how I felt. But when I took step, I knew exactly what they were asking me. It was just a matter of, do I know the best correct answer? And then sometimes that was between two answers, but the MBMEs were not that straight to the point as step one was. So take your MBMEs with a grain of salt, and I say taking maybe two or three tops. And like I said, it all depends on your study style. If you are continually, continually progressing or whatever it is, do that. But honestly, I think they're more useful for being a gauge of your weaknesses and your strengths and just to see what is the overall concepts that you need to look into and what are the high yield concepts that may be tested on step one. So the fourth one is a big one. So the fourth thing I want to say is that step one tests a lot of concepts from first year of medical school. And that's something that not a lot of people know or realize. And sometimes a lot of these concepts are buried in a clinical question. Like for instance, they may ask you about an MI or heart attack. And it seems like they're asking you something about the mechanism or something like that, but then the answer choices are just a bunch of arteries. So when you look at that, that's basically a basic anatomy question. And those are questions that you could have answered as a first year medical student. It's very important to remember that step one is going to test clinical concepts that you learn in second year, but it's also going to test those basic foundational sciences like anatomy, biochemistry, immunology, and there was a lot of stuff from first year that I was like, oh, good thing I was like good in immunology or, you know, remember this thing from anatomy. And, you know, that's easy questions like you can get on the test on test day. So my best advice for you is to definitely brush up on some of those first year material, like your anatomy questions, like those Gray's anatomy questions, the musculoskeletal, uh, heart anatomy, GI anatomy, all that good stuff. Of course, first aid is necessary. First aid has a lot of concepts, a lot of con content and high yield information. So I would definitely recommend like the BRS series or, or any resources you used in first year to help you study for those foundational concepts. Brush up on those, especially if you're getting some of those questions wrong because it will show up on your test. Five, mm, five, this is, this is tea, honey, this is tea. Five is what is the most representative question style and resource that will represent the question style of step one. And that is, drum roll please. Oh, that's a little piece. Anyway, how about I do this? 
I will do it from least representative to most representative. The least representative style, MBME, next is UWorld. So when I say UWorld, I'm talking about just straight up question style. I think UWorld's questions and, and explanations are superb for step one. I think the question style is much more difficult than step one. I think step one is straight to the point. You know exactly what they're asking you. You're not, you know, confused as to, is this a tricky question or what are they asking me? And UWorld, they're very good at like having those tricky questions and, you know, just kind of making you think a little bit more. But step one is straight up, they're right to the point. Second is, going backwards is when I have three hands up. <laughs> The second most representative question style is the USMLE free 120 pack. So the free 120 is actually administered by the USMLE and BME company. And it's free, it's online, you can access that. And it's 120 questions that are uh, written in a similar style to the step one exam. I took the free 120 a few days before my exam and I was like, okay, well, if USMLE wrote these, like maybe this is the style it will be, which is much better for me because now I know what they're asking me and they're very direct, straight to the point. And I found that those questions were the most representative of the style. But my final most representative style of questions and also just the general like yield of questions and content wise was Kaplan's full-length exams. Kaplan full-length exams were pretty spot-on. There's a way to use Kaplan. I didn't use the rest of the QBank for Kaplan's, but I did do all of their practice exams that they had. And what I will say is there were definitely a couple of biostatistics questions that were literally like the same question with the exception of, you know, some numbers or whatever that I saw on my Kaplan full-length so the rest of the questions on my exam weren't exactly word for word like Kaplan, but content wise and high yield wise, it was pretty spot on the distribution of topics and things like that, that Kaplan's full length test had focused on. But my main focus was UWorld, of course, first aid, and then Petoma and the rest of them to supplement my learning. Number six is taking breaks. I remember reading a blog about this person who scored a 270 and she was from Harvard and she was saying you should take at least one day off during your dedicated study time or even take a half day and I was like no that's not happening I have to study every day I don't think I can do this and I'm like she's from Harvard like you know she can do that because she's from Harvard but looking back I was like, wow, that was actually genius. I should have done that. And I actually had to force myself to take a couple of days off because I had realized I was burning out. And there was a time where my test was a week away and I failed another practice test. And my mom was straight up like, you are burnt out. You need to stop, reset, recharge. And that's what I did for a few days. I came back, I studied and my mind was clear and I was ready to go. And then you know, I took my test and passed and, you know, the rest is history. But I definitely should have done that. I should have taken either like a Friday or a Saturday, even if it was a half day, just to go out with my family, friends, go out for drinks, exercise, whatever it is. You need to do that to like stop, reset and recharge your brain to keep going. Studying for step one is a marathon and you have to have this energy for the long term, for the long haul. And that's something that I definitely, definitely, definitely suggest that you do. Please take a day off or half day off. It will benefit you. You will reap the rewards. It will decrease or eliminate your burnout, I assure you. Number seven, do not, do not, do not study the day before your exam. Going back to that post that the Harvard student had wrote about her 270 experience. She recommended not studying the day before your exam. Once again, me being the crazy person that I am, 
I said, I will just study half of the day and I'll stop studying around 2 p.m. But of course I woke up at 8 a.m. and I studied for like six hours, stopped studying at 2 p.m. And I went about my day, I was listening to music and just like, okay, whatever, I'm gonna go to sleep at 8 p.m. so I could wake up for my 8 a.m. exam. And when 8 p.m. came, I had already showered, I was ready for bed, got into bed and I started tossing and turning. Next thing you know, I look at my phone, it's three hours later and it's 11 p.m. And then I start to have a mini panic attack. I'm like, okay, it's fine, I can just go back to sleep. So I go back to sleep or try to. Once again, tossing and turning, look at my phone again, it's 1 a.m. I get out of bed, go to my kitchen, grab some chamomile tea and start Googling how to, <laughs> what I can, what else I can drink or eat to make me sleepy, make me go to sleep. And I don't know, I was just out of it. I had the tea, went back into bed, could not go to sleep. I was tossing and turning, freaking out. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to sleep. What am I going to do? I'm freaking out. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. By like 6 a.m., I was still up. I didn't sleep. I had to get ready for my exam because I was in Brooklyn. And so I got ready, went to the test center. I was a little out of it for the first section. And I did have to like rush for the last few questions of that section. But then by the next few rounds after, next few blocks after that, my adrenaline kicked in and I was just like, no, this is a high stakes exam. I gotta click, I gotta click, I gotta do this, blah, blah, blah. So whatever, I finished my exam and as you know, whatever, I passed. But basically, had I just listened to the students that said do not study the day before your exam, I probably would have had a clearer mind. I wouldn't have been thinking about the exam. I would have been able to reset and recharge and I probably would have done way better on my exam. But hindsight is twenty twenty, so that's why I'm telling you, please do not make the same mistake that I made and do not study the day before the exam. Give yourself that day to rest, relax. You've been working hard. You deserve it. And do not feel guilty. So yeah, that's the seven things no one ever tells you about STEP. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Good luck to everyone studying for step one. You got this, you'll rock this. Make sure to hit me up on Instagram or email if you're on my newsletter and I will be there to help you out with anything, any questions that you have. I'm rooting for you as always and I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.